Hey, my name is Matt Storr and I repair saxophones for a living. And today I would like to briefly talk to you about the Selmer USA padless saxophone. Now I actually have to give this instrument back in just a few minutes, so I don't have very much time to do this video. I didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare, so I apologize in advance. But there's not an awful lot of info out there about these, so I figured I might as well make a video. Now the Selmer USA, it's very important, it's not Selmer Paris, Selmer USA padless saxophone was a saxophone made without pads. Instead of pads, it has these sort of gasket rings in a channel that has been soldered onto the outside of the tone hole. And I'm kind of like a little gutter. And then the pad cups are just flat pieces of metal that close down onto those gaskets to make the pad seal. Or to make the, I guess, um, pneumatic seal. And the entire surface that is exposed to the bore after the pads, or sorry, after the keys are closed is a flat metal, basically a giant resonator the size of the tone hole. And I'll go ahead and stick a leak light in here to show you what I'm talking about. Um, these instruments were researched in 1938. Production started in 1941 and was stopped shortly after that um, due to World War II, meaning that nobody could make anything out of brass unless the government asked them to. So not a lot of saxophones were made. So maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand of these uh, got made. You don't see a ton of them around, and when you do, usually they're not in decent playing condition. This one is absolutely original. This is what the original setup looked like. Um, and you can see the tone rings there. And you can see the, I guess, the key cups. <laughs> the key surfaces there. Um, and you can see the really beautiful engraving. Now, this instrument was manufactured by Bisher uh, in an agreement with Selmer USA, not Selmer Paris. And the body tube of this is basically a Bisher Aristocrat Series 1. If you've ever played one, you recognize the unique shape of the very small, narrow-throated bell on the Bisher Aristocrat Series 1. Um, the neck is quite similar as well. Look, they even did the tone rings on the octave pads, which is kind of funny. Um, so the guy who made this was named Eugene Sander, and he was the head of R&D at Selmer USA, and he also invented the material necessary to make these work. And they are, it's the same stuff as in Tonex pads. So Tonex pads are sax and clarinet, and I think they even made them for flute, uh, pads that are basically a sheet good that they, that they then stamp out, and is trying to basically figure out how to make cheaper sax pads. Um, and you can see, if you look on the back there, you can see the patent number. You can look that up if you want to. Um, although if you read the patent, it looks a little bit different than these pads actually do in, in person. See, I think I have one of these cut up, do I? Yep, here we go. Okay, here is a Tonex pad cross section. Uh, you can see it's basically two layers of really cheap leather with some waterproofing and paint and then a thick layer of cardstock. Um, so just to sort of see what that looked like, I made two of them, two similar things myself. This is thinner leather with thin cardstock and then thicker leather with thick cardstock. And you can see this looks pretty darn similar. Um, these held up relatively well over time, uh, but they failed as a product because right when these came out, saxophone companies have been trying to convince everybody that resonators were of huge importance, where in the teens and 20s they hadn't been. Um, then in the 30s, people started putting resonators in their horns more often. Uh, indeed, this saxophone was marketed as being a giant leap forward because, specifically, that the entire surface of the key that is exposed to the bore is metal. So at the same time they're trying to convince everybody that it's so important that there needs to be a major redesign of the saxophone, they're also saying, no, please, buy Tonex pads that don't have resonators, it's no big deal. Um, here is an original ad from the era. You can see Tonex pads get livelier tone, more volume, and last longer. Specify tone X pads your next sax or clarinet overhaul, um, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to try and sell both those things at the same time. Um, neither of them ended up doing too well. Tone X pads lasted a little bit longer. Sometimes you see these installed in saxophones that were repatted in the 50s. This instrument was only made for about a year, um, and probably not just because people didn't want to buy it, um, probably also because uh, wartime production stopped. Right, So if you were a saxophone maker in the United States at the beginning of World War II, there was a restrictive measure passed by the government, I believe it's L37 or L37A or something, I was just looking at this, um, that meant you couldn't make anything, you could not produce a good 
that was non-war related that was made up of more than 10% copper. And brass is mostly copper. So obviously there were not a whole lot of musical instruments made. And the factories, indeed, were turned over to wartime production. Kahn, for instance, made altimeters. So this is basically a Bischer aristocrat with a lot of the stuff you recognize from Bischer aristocrat with a couple of Selmer looking touches, um, specifically on the octave mechanism here. Um, but this is basically a Bischer aristocrat that has been heavily modified, um, ornately engraved, and I believe, it, I believe it was assembled by Selmer USA, but the parts were made by Bischer, um, and everything looks pretty familiar. Now, as far as the playing uh, experience of this instrument, um, it's a great horn, it's lively, it's fun, it feels basically like a saxophone under the fingers, except the, you know, with these old uh, gaskets on here, it's pretty noisy. Um, but it does play pretty well, but it's not like, you know, it's not like the greatest saxophone or the, you know, the, like it sounds significantly different than anything I've ever played. Um, you know, if you want big tone, just go ahead and grab a con. It does it without any, um, you know, unique and difficult to repair tone rings. But this is a very interesting saxophone, very cool. One of the few times you see someone really going out on a limb to innovate and do something very different than had been done or was being done. Um, and they did it really well. It is kind of a really cool um, solution or cool, you know, uh, approach to the problem of, uh, you know, having a large portion of the body of the saxophone be of a soft material when the pads are closed. So this is a very cool instrument. You don't see too many of these. Maybe a thousand were made, maybe. Um, again, these are manufactured by Bischer, uh, assembled and sold by Selmer USA. Selmer Paris had nothing to do with this. Um, but that is the Selmer padless saxophone. They came in tenor and alto. Um, if you want to repad these, you're going to have to make something here. Um, a lot of times people use rubber gaskets. I think if I were to ever be tasked with making one of these, I would probably make up like a sheet of stuff that was like the Tonex uh, pads originally were. Um, but that's extremely difficult to do. I mean, the tooling to make these rings would be pretty expensive. Oh, and that's another thing. It kind of started off as a joke, I think, but a lot of times people say, oh yeah, like the... The rings on those were made up of the leftover pieces of Tonex pads, but if you think about it, obviously it doesn't make sense. That means that they started off with a perfect circle, and then they stamped out a slightly smaller circle in the middle with like perfect symmetry around it in order to get the Tonex pads, which obviously doesn't make sense. They made it in a huge sheet, and then they would stamp out whatever they needed, all the different sizes, including the rings. So that is the missed a few things, um, uh, but... You know, like I said, this has to go out the door in just a few minutes here. I had it in my hands. It's in beautiful original condition. I thought I would show you guys uh, what you could see. And just to give you a little more close up on those sort of gutters around the edge where those gaskets are seated. So it looks like they pulled up the tone holes in a normal way and then just soldered those rings around the edge. And that's it. Hope you found this helpful, useful, informative. My name is Matt Storr. I repair saxophones for a living. Thanks for watching.